so where I left off last time was uh, the discussion of this uh, ABT lemma and the, and the Bruns fire theorem. ABT lemma says that if you have um, A, B, and T in if one of the interval with uh, A intersect sub B empty and T arbitrary, then uh, subgroup generated by T A B is not ever isomorphic to Z squared. Product Z. I'll, I'll comment on that a little bit more. But um, to give an idea of how the group works, uh, we're talking about the Brin Squire theorem. So, uh, PL plus I uh, has no non abelian free groups and satisfies no law. So the satisfies no law already justified last time. And so we'll talk about why there are no three abelian subgroups, sorry, three non abelian subgroups. And so this argument, uh, so I think even Brennan Squire write in their 1985 paper that um, the basic idea goes back quite a long time to like Zassenhaus. So how might one begin? Okay, so so let, let's, let's let F and G in PL I be arbitrary. So it suffices to show uh, F and G satisfy a relation. F and G are completely arbitrary, so we need some sort of very general argument to analyze this. So here's the interval. And F and G are just some homeomorphisms that are uh, that are acting by on the interval by piecewise linear maps with finitely many breakpoints. So if you'll remember, I've already at least implicitly used the notion of support homeomorphisms many times which are so the support of a homeomorphism is this open set consisting of points that are not fixed by the homeomorphism so let's just take it take the support of the subgroup generated by f and g so support of the subgroup generated by f and g this is equal to the support of f union the support of G. And each of these are themselves some union of intervals inside of I, but very crucially, finitely many inter intervals. So maybe something like this, you have maybe, I don't know, three intervals that together make up the support of and this is where I'm using crucially, well, one place where I'm crucially using the fact that these homeomorphisms are piecewise. So now, what can we do? Well, let's consider the element H, which is just the commutator of F and G. So if H is the identity, then there's nothing to show. F, F and G did not generate a non-abelian free group. Okay. So we can assume that this is not the identity. So let's consider the support of H. So H, its support is clearly contained inside of the support of the full group. And so it's contained inside of this union of, of three intervals. But how? Well, again, now this is, Another place where we crucially use the fact that we're working with piecewise linear homeomorphisms. So if we consider an endpoint of one of these uh, components of support, then this point is globally fixed by the group generated by F and H. 
And we can compute uh, the way I've drawn it here, the right derivative map at this, this point. Now the chain rule tells us that that's a homomorphism from the group generated by F and G to the real line. Uh, if, this is, uh, if this is actually the left endpoint of a component of the support of the full group, that homomorphism is non-trivial. So these are just simply, I'm just really computing the, the slope of a piecewise linear map to the, to the right of, of that fixed point. Okay, so now what's the slope of H at that fixed point? Well, it's, it's the commutator of two things, right? And so, uh, and the image of that, that homomorphism that I just described, which is the germs of the group of piecewise linear homeomorphisms at this point, that has to be the identity. So the, uh, the slope, let's call this point X, of, of H at, at one, uh, at, at X is equal to one. So H is the identity to the left of X, but it's also the identity in a neighborhood to the right of X. And this is true at every endpoint of a component of the support of H. So what does that mean? So H may have many more components in its support than, uh, than, uh, than three, as I've drawn it here. But the point is, is that no endpoint of a component of the support of H coincides with a component of the support of the whole group. So in particular, we have that. I take the support of H and I take its closure. This is contained inside of or F union. Okay, so if you'll recall, I, I said that finding a compactly supported homeomorphism is sort of the key in, in playing these sorts of games as I have, have here. So what can we do with this now? So we can leverage this compactly supported homeomorphism to find a relation between F and G. And how might we do that? Well, maybe let's concentrate on this particular component of the support of H. So I'll, I'll label these things, maybe uh, you know, J1, J2, and J3 are these components. So now let's zoom in on J1. So of course, J1 itself may not be a component of the support of either F or G, but it's a union of components. So we can imagine that maybe I'll, I'll draw, you know, uh, the, the sort of same bubble picture that I had before of what components of F and G on J1 look like. So maybe here's an F component. And maybe here's a G component. Maybe here's another F. And here's another G. And, and in each of these, of course, it may be more complicated than that. But the point is, is that under any one of these arcs, either F or G moves every point to the right or every point to the left. So now what do we have? So we have now this support of, component. Uh, so some components of the support of H. So just for simplicity, I'm just gonna write that as some compact subinterval of J1 because it is contained in some compact subinterval. So this here, let's call it K, is uh, where the support of H inside of J1 lies. Okay. So what can I do with this? Well, take this point, which is, uh, again, uh, I call that one X. So let's call this one Y, the inf of K. So, what I can do now is apply some power of F, positive or negative, so that I land inside of this component of the support of G, so that Y lands there. And now apply some suitable power of, the, of, uh, of G, so that I land, um, maybe not, not there, uh, right, right here, within this, this next arc, and then over here, and then over here to the right of this point. 
z, which is the soup of k. So I can, I, the exact word that you need to apply in f and g depends on the configuration of points and it depends on how quickly those points are getting moved by these homeomorphisms. But the point is, is that there exists some word in f and g so that if I apply this to inf k, this is going to be greater than sup k. So I can move this point y to the right of z. And so then what? Well, if I look at the restriction of h acting on j1, I look at h acting on maybe right that restricted j1, and I look at the conjugate of h by w restricted by uh, restricted to j1. I take the commutator of these two things. Well, I have something that's supported here and something that's supported over here. This becomes the identity. And now if F and G were supposed to generate a free group, there's no way that, that this element is the identity inside of the free group on F and G as formal symbols. So that's a relation of this group generated by F and G on this particular interval J1. And so now that handles the case of one component of the support of the full group. But now I can repeat the same game. Now I replace my initial H with this new element, which is now the identity. Well, it's only possibly the, the, not the identity on a smaller number of components of the support of the full group generated by F and G. So then by induction on the number of components, I can actually furnish an explicit relation between F and G. Then this means that we get a, a relation between F and G. In fact, you can say more. You can say that any non-abelian subgroup of PLI contains a subgroup that's isomorphic to uh, Z to the infinity, like some direct, so infinite direct sum of copies of Z. So that's a um, very strange feature of piecewise linear homeomorphisms of the interval. Right. So that's the proof of, of the Brin Squire theorem. Okay, so if we return briefly to this ABT lemma, which I sort of indicated that this explains like which right angled Artin groups can act with what kind of regularity on compact one manifolds. It, it, so the reason that this group is never isomorphic to Z squared free product Z is in the end, same reason as in the Brin Squire theorem. Of course, there are some complications that may occur. The supports of T, A, and B may themselves uh, not have finitely many components. And at the germ, uh, just because you have, so, so piecewise linear homeomorphisms have this nice property that if you look at, if you compute the germ, uh, that is to say the derivatives at a fixed point, if you're the identity, then you're, an, you're the identity in a neighborhood of that point. And that's just not true in general for diffeomorphism. So, when, so the, the way that you have to prove this is to um, leverage the differentiability to find a compactly supported, supported uh, uh, element in the group A. B, C. And then because the su support is actually compacted, it can only meet uh, finitely many components of the full support of the group. And then you can run the same argument as you run for the Brin Squire theorem. Because you have to find this compactly supported homeomorphism or diffeomorphism. So then this uh, the failure of this of this group generated by T, A, and B to be isomorphic to Z squared star Z is ultimately non-constructive. It really depends on which action you choose. And 
kind of the same argument as, as I uh, showed with the, uh, the, the action of F2 on the real line shows that if I prescribe to you in advance any finite list of non-trivial words in Z squared pre-product Z, I can find you an action by C1 diffeomorphisms satisfying these hypotheses where those particular words survive. They're not trivial. But then some other word, which will be you know, much, much more complicated, will become the identity. So maybe uh, <clears throat> that's enough about that. Uh, so that's, I think those, those are sort of the, some of the ideas that go into um, regularity in right angled art groups. So I had mentioned one more class of groups that I'd like to think about from the point of view of, of regularity. So those are mapping class groups of surfaces. The thing about mapping class groups of surfaces is that uh, their subgroup structure is very, very complicated. And um, however, okay, so let's say that you wanted to prove just directly that a mapping class group uh, cannot act by C2 diffeomorphisms on, say, the interval or the circle. So one can use some various algebraic tricks, which I won't get into in too much detail. So there's uh, an argument of, of Farb and Franks. So they use uh, Coppell's lemma grade relations between uh, certain Dane twists, which uh, I introduced to us before already, uh, to show that the mapping class group mod sigma does not sit as a subgroup of diff two. Uh, if let's say if, if if sigma is complicated enough, there are always some. There's a finite number of of exceptions to these sorts of statements. Uh, and to improve that, to once differentiable map, so that there's a theorem of, of man and wolf that actually shows that uh, they, they use Thurston, Thurston stability, which I introduced last uh, two times ago. And uh, a rigidity of, of actions on, on S1 results. They prove that basically any, any action of the whole mapping class group on the circle is conjugate, semi-conjugate, uh, almost conjugate, I'll just say, to the action of the mapping class group on the circle that I showed was discovered by Nielsen over 100 years ago. Um, to show that um, mod sigma cannot sit inside of diff one. So I'd like to say a little bit more than that because these are sort of, um, so these are results that require in some sense the full strength of uh, the mapping class group. And, and so some interest in looking at finite index subgroups of mapping class groups was already mentioned in the problem session yesterday. Um, and so let me say a little bit more why it might be that why you might want to look at such things. So the basic reason which has sort of a lot of heuristic support from the results that have been proved about mapping class groups is that you know, there's a dictionary of results between mapping class groups on the one hand and, and lattices in semi-simple Lie groups. So what these are supposed to be are our, our uh, discrete, uh, discrete subgroups with finite co-volume, like you can think of something like PSLNZ inside of PSLNR, if you, if you just want to be uh, explicit about it. 
And you know, in this in this world, there's sort of a pretty sharp dichotomy between lattices which have higher rank, which is to say that uh, they contain subgroups that are isomorphic to Z squared and ones which do not. And because there's no sort of, so there are oftentimes results that, a result about mapping class groups is mirrored by a result about lattices, but there's not always an agreement about the rank. And so sometimes the mapping class group behaves like a lattice of rank one, and sometimes like one of higher rank, some people say that it's like a lattice of rank one and a half. It's not actually, not even up to passing to a finite index subgroup, isomorphic to a lattice in any semi-simple Lie group. But no matter, this is also just supposed to motivate why we should look at finite index subgroups of mapping class groups. So lattices are only well-defined really up to commensurability. That is to say, you know, you sort of, Think about one lattice here in, and another lattice of the same group, and maybe if up to maybe conjugating, they have finite index intersection, then they're more or less the same. So, and insofar as most of their dynamical and algebraic geometric properties, that's why it sort of makes sense to consider. Uh, mapping class groups uh, up to, to finite index. So if one does that, then uh, the Barb Franks and the Man Wolf, uh, the, the theorems, they, they, don't, they don't carry through because they both use properties of, of mapping class groups that, that disappear when you pass to finite index subgroups. So for instance, if you have uh, I mean, you can have a finite index subgroups where you don't have any braiding between Dane twists anymore because you know, single power, like uh, single powers of Dane twists, do not sit inside of this mapping class group anymore. And the Man Wolf theorem, it, it relied on you know, orbifolds and torsion and stuff that also disappears when you pass to finite index subgroups. In general, we know very little about general. Finite index subgroups, like uh, we don't know if uh, there are so all sorts of conjectures about uh, like congruent congruent subgroup property kinds of things that uh, that may be true and are known and maybe braid groups, but not in general for mapping classes. So we don't even know if like what abelianizations of finite index subgroups look like in general. But then, so what what can we say about uh, mapping class groups and, and their actions on the interval in the circle when you allow yourself passage to finite index subgroups. Well, so um, so the, the theorem with, which combines work of some people, I'll just say that uh, I'll take not have to specify exactly which mapping class groups fall in which cracks here. I'll just say uh, most, and so if sigma is not not one of finitely many exceptions, then if, if gamma is a finite index subgroup of mod, mod sigma, you have that, Gamma does not sit as a subgroup of diff one tau of M for any tau greater than or equal to zero. Or greater than zero, not greater than or equal to. So the question does gamma embed into diff one of M is open. Okay. So I mean, the, <clears throat> I can say sort of, I mean, so historically, this is not the statement that was, that was proved. So what was proved originally is that either a mapping class group is basically, you know, virtually a free, free group or free group cross integers. 
or no finite index subgroup acted by twice differential homeomorphisms. And that was a that was the main theorem in, in this paper. And then at the expense of excluding a few more surfaces, things like a sphere with five punctures or a torus with three or fewer punctures, then you can upgrade that to diff one comma tau. And so maybe that uh, seems like a new class of, of results, but it's actually not uh, if you apply the right, say what tools you can apply. So there are very few things that you can do with mapping class groups and all their finite index subgroups. But one thing that you can, one thing that persists in all finite index subgroups is, well, you have, let's say two mapping classes. Let's just say that they have infinite order they may or may not commute with each other. And in a finite index subgroup, you can find powers which lie inside of that finite index subgroup. And if they commute it up here, then they commute down here. And if they didn't commute up here, then they almost certainly generate a free group down here. And that sounds like right angle Darton group-like behavior, and that's true. So I'll state some, some version of the, the simplified version of this theorem, which says that if the gamma one, gamma n are, are pairwise non-isotopic uh, essential simple closed curves on a surface sigma, then there exists an n which depends on what this collection gamma, uh, gamma one to gamma n was, such that if you take the subgroup generated by the Dane twists, gamma one to the n, yeah, I'll just say for all n sufficiently large, because that's true, uh, Tn to the big n, is isomorphic to some right angled Artin group, A of gamma, where the vertices of gamma are just gamma one to gamma n, and the edges of gamma are given by uh, disjoint, representative, disjoint representatives of the isotopy classes. So once you have that, you see that, that once you have just some configuration of curves on a surface, then you get right angled Arden groups out of it, which ones which persist in all finite index subgroups. And you can you reduce the study of the isomorphism types of those right angled Arden groups to just the combinatorial topology of the surface. So um, one of the theorems that I, I stated last time about you know, the regularity of of a right angled Artin groups was that you know, F2 cross F2 you know, pre product Z does not sit inside of diff one tau of M for tau greater than zero. That was a, that's the, really the result in, in this paper with him and Rivas. So, how do you find such a subgroup in the side of a mapping class group in that? persists in all finite index subgroups. Well, you can take a genus two surface like that. You take gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, gamma four like that. So you check that even squares of the Dane twists about these curves generate a copy of F2 cross F2. And then for the fifth curve, you just choose something that intersects all of them. I'm not gonna try and draw that. So that's already enough poison to preclude the, the mapping class, any finite index so of the GS2 closed mapping class from acting by C1 plus tau diffusion on any compact one map. So what can we 
where can we go from here? As you may have, uh, as you may be getting the feeling now, a lot of what we talk about here is uh, or a lot of what I've been trying to do is this sort of race to see, well, just how unsmoothable are particular groups. So if you know that a particular group say acts by homeomorphisms or maybe by diffeomorphisms, and you know that it cannot act by C infinity diffeomorphisms. And so then what's, so what's the, the, the largest, the highest degree of regularity that it can act by? I mean, that seems like a pretty reasonable invariant that a group possesses. Maybe not reasonable to compute, but it's, it's a thing that's defined. So you can call that, that uh, critical regularity. So if you have gamma inside of homeo plus of M, then you can write the CR uh, M of gamma is just a soup uh, over R. Uh, oops. So um, R such that gamma can be realized by the subgroup of diff R plus. So few remarks. Uh, this is like an algebraic critical regularity because I'm I'm not asking. I'm, I'm here. I'm talking about gamma, some abstract group. So. These injective maps, they may have nothing to do with the original realization of gamma as a subgroup of homeo of M. You can ask similarly, like if I give you gamma as a subgroup of homeo of M, to, into what's the greatest level of regularity to which that group is conjugate? That's like a topological conjugacy question of critical regularity, which I, I don't really have much to say about that. Um, I'll just concentrate on the algebraic question. And even if you're able to compute this number for a group, then uh, there are some sort of possibly extremely difficult questions that remain. Things like, is this supremum actually achieved or not? And there are examples where it is achieved and examples where it is not achieved. So let's uh, state a, a few, few results that are, that are known. Okay. So at least within the, the class of groups that we've been discussing over the last two and a half lectures. So <clears throat> in the world of, of nilpotent groups, and free nilpotent groups, okay. uh, we know that uh, the critical regularity for M or for I is always bounded above by two. And so uh, on the other hand, by this theorem of, of Parquet uh, and combined with the work of Corquera, you know that the critical regularity is at least one. Well, let me comment on this uh, inequality a little bit first. So if I, if I start with a group gamma inside of homeo plus M, and we'll assume that this is at least at most countable. So, uh, uh, so what is the minimum value that, that the critical regularity can achieve? I mean, if this supreme were say equal to one, then you should say something like, well, so if you say the critical regularity of some group is equal to one, then that should mean that gamma sits as a group of diffeomorphisms of M. And for some technical reasons, I think that's probably not the right way to look uh, to look at it because if you're if you're looking at say diff diff k tau, where where k is an integer and tau is between zero and one. And then you let tau tends to one, then you end up uh, in the limit. In some sense you get diff k one, which is like 
even says like diff k plus one, which is not the same as diff k plus one, because these are CK diffeomorphisms whose kth derivatives are Lipschitz, whereas diff k plus one consists of diffeomorphisms which are k plus one times differentiable. If the kth derivative is, is Lipschitz, then it's differentiable almost everywhere. But it may not be differentiable everywhere. And so there, there is an actual like quantitative difference between these, these groups. But <clears throat> for the purposes of counting, I'm not going to distinguish between them, especially for, in, for purposes of, of evaluating this supremo. And that also gives us some uh, <clears throat> absolute lower bound on what critical regularity can be for homeomorphism groups inside of, uh, of, of the interval land of, of S1. This is uh, from a result, due, uh, this is from a paper due to, to Derouin, uh, Nava, uh, Clepson, and Navas, which I think I, I won't have time to present a proof today, but it's... it's um, so, so Thomas, I missed what you said has critical regularity greater than or equal to one. Oh, uh, so, I, so all torsion-free nilpotent groups have critical regularity at, at least one because we realized- Oh, so you're uh, still talking about that, okay. Yeah, but so if we, there's a theorem of due to Derouin, Clepson, and Navas that says if, if gamma inside of homeo of M is countable, then, then gamma is conjugate into uh, by Lipschitz, by Lipschitz homeomorphisms. And this uses the the proof that I know of this uses uh, diffusion operators and uh, stationary measures. Uh, some of this functional analysis very similar to the Banach-Alaoglu theorem that I talked about this morning. And basically, you you integrate you you sort of. Uh, assume that gamma acts with a dense orbit, which you can always do by adding an irrational rotation to it. And then you find a, a, one of these stationary measures, which is almost like an invariant measure, but it really has to do with you know, convolution with some evolution operator on, on this group. And you uh, <coughs> integrate against that measure. And uh, that gives you a uh, a homeomorphism by which you conjugate gamma and you just do some computations and you get that, that gamma then acts by bilipschitz homeomorphisms. That's in a nutshell of that. So, so bilipschitz homeomorphisms is that's like, this is like diff, diff zero one of M. So there are zero times differentiable homeomorphisms which would, with bilipschitz zeroth derivatives. And so, in some reasonable sense, if you have, you can start with a group that you know is a subgroup of, of homeo plus M, and the critical regularity is always at least one. So, no provisos, no nothing. Okay, so how do we talk about critical regularity of actual groups? Because that seems very difficult to compute. Uh, a survey of some, uh, some facts that were established by. by uh, Castro, Corquera, Navas, uh, Rivas, in, in, in some various combinations. I can, we can talk about the, who exactly proved what la later. Uh, so if you take the Heisenberg group, and I, well, the first nilpotent group that I produced, uh, the critical regularity of the Heisenberg group is exactly equal to two. So that means for every tau, you can find an action by C1 plus tau diffeomorphisms. Yes. Have we seen any groups that of homeo plus M that aren't conjugate into diff one? Uh, <clears throat> no, we haven't, uh, but there do exist such things, yes. Yeah. So I, actually, um, in the problem session, you see either Adam or Ty, I forgot, wrote, wrote down an explicit presentation of one that comes from a, uh, it's a cipher three manifold group. Okay. Uh, if you look at the uh, critical regularity of, uh, I'll write this N4. So these are uh, four by four 
uh, integer uh, unipotent matrices. So four by four matrices, ones down the diagonal, zeros below anything above. So the critical regularity is equal to exactly 1.5. And uh, it's unknown as far as I know if it's realized. An assortment of uh, other results about critical regularity of nilpotent groups, which I won't mention right now, uh, but those are, this is sort of the flavor that one, one gets. So for, for right angled Artin groups, so uh, there are three possibilities. Uh, so either the critical regularity is, is infinity. So that those are the ones which are which decompose as direct products of free products of free abelian groups. And then there's something between one and two, which was if if it can if it contains uh, F2 plus Z free product Z, and then exactly equal to one if it contains F2 cross F2 free product Z. And this, the, the picture here isn't, isn't complete. I mean, it's complete for the ones which have critical regularity infinity and the ones which have uh, critical regularity equal to one. And for these, we simply just, I just don't know what the cutoff is, but it's somewhere between one and uh, And for mapping class groups, it's uh, the same, same picture uh, for, for finite index subgroups. So some of them on the very, very simplest surfaces, their the mapping class groups are very simple right angle garden groups already up to finite index. And so their critical regularity is infinite. There are some like say the uh, a sphere with five punctures where the critical regularity is somewhere between one and two, and I don't know. And then things that are more complicated than that where the critical regularity is exactly equal to one. Uh, open question about the mapping class group of closed surfaces. Something okay. mentioned like yesterday. Uh, so about whether or not they they have a finite index subgroup which even sits inside of uh, homeo plus m at all. Okay. And if if not, maybe then the should define the critical regularity to be like minus infinity or something like that. If it doesn't sit as a subgroup there at all. Yeah. Do you have any example where depends on the manifold? because you are not writing Right, so um, good question. So I don't know. Uh, so all these, uh, so for writing a large groups, it, it doesn't depend on the manifold. And for mapping class groups, I suspect that for instance, for a, uh, so when I say that it's the same picture, this is for ones which actually do act on, on these manifolds for, for, for sure. So maybe I should say it's at most one for like closed, uh, for closed you know, genus at least two. The uh, critical regularity is at most one just because uh, it may be just be minus infinity if, if they don't act at all on the circle or on the line. And for punctured mapping class groups, I don't know if they're virtually left orderable or not. And so then there may be a difference between the circle and the interval, but I, I simply don't know. Okay, so we've very sparsely populated this spectrum of possible values of critical regularity. Maybe let's try and fill it in a little bit. Well, uh, we'll just state a theorem. So then, uh, so given, given R, uh, which I'll write it as k plus tau, or here k is a natural number and tau is between zero and one. And then I'll, I'll just use this shorthand if r uh, be diff k tau to keep it consistent with the notation that I had before. So, uh, and we'll let m be either the interval or the circle as before. 
So there exists a, a finitely generated, you can take this to be uh, n equals five or, or m equal to the interval and seven for m equal to the circle. Finitely generated group uh, G M R a subgroup of if R M with the following properties. First is that uh, the commutator subgroup uh, is infinite and simple, simple, and that for and then for all well S greater than R uh, and all the uh, any any homomorphism from G M R to if S plus M factors uh, through an abelian group. And so this uh this shows is that for all for all R there exists a group, finitely generated group, in fact, such that the critical regularity of, of G is equal to exactly R. With a little bit more work, one can show that every R can be, uh, is the critical regularity of, a, of some group where that R is achieved and or another group where that R is not achieved. So, Things are as complicated as they could possibly be. And maybe in my remaining time, just a few minutes, <clears throat> I can, I mean, uh, there's not nearly enough of time, I think, to give even a reasonable sketch of, of how the proof of this goes. But the, um, <laughs> the basic idea is again to show that it, so you you build you build um gm r I'll, I'll write it in quotes explicitly uh because it's not really explicit i mean you end up writing down some particular homeomorphisms which you define as like integrals of of certain functions which have to satisfy some vanishing properties to guarantee that they are actually acting by uh, CR diffeomorphisms. And so this the, the way that one builds sort of CR diffeomorphisms, which are not CS diffeomorphisms for any S greater than R, is really by controlling the growth of orbits. So if you'll recall, one of the first things I did Yesterday, as I talked about, like if you have some accumulation point of supports of some homeomorphism, and you have a, a point that gets moved a definite amount across each of these intervals of support, then that homeomorphism cannot, if it if, even if each of these are separately differentiable, then the derivative is not continuous at this endpoint. So what if you slowed everything down? So maybe on the nth uh, on the nth interval, you have to raise the diffeomorphism to the nth power to get most of the way across. Well, you can then realize that kind of dynamical behavior by a C1 diffeomorphism, but the second derivative will not be continuous. Maybe then what if you have to raise it to the n squared power? Well, then you get something which is C2, but not C3 anymore. It's the same sort of, you play the same games with the mean value theorem to, uh, to build diffeomorphisms, which are sort of as close to being, so they're, they're, they're like CR, but they're just like, they can't possibly be any smoother than that, just because the, the rate at which they move points is just critically too fast to be any smoother. And so then what do you do? Well, you have to argue 
that somehow, well, I've already kind of told you that, that, the, that the smoother a diffeomorphism is, the more slowly it can sort of bump points along in, in some sequence of intervals of its support. So the idea to prove a result like this is to leverage that and say, look, I start with this group, which is like ju just barely manages to be CR. I move it into this, uh, and I just take some homomorphism into CS diffeomorphisms. Like the, the number, so if I look at the support of some element that you have to get there in, in uh, the group of CS diffeomorphisms, I have to, I would have to raise much higher powers in CS diffeomorphisms than I did in CR diffeomorphisms to move points, definite distances across intervals of support. And so what that allows you to do is it allows you to build an element first that is a commutator of sub of commutator of, of generators. And so that whenever you represent this group GR inside of CS diffeomorphisms, its support is compactly contained inside of the full support of the group. Whereas you have to then argue that it well actually it wasn't inside of the original group, and then you find relations that were that are present inside of the image, which were not there originally. You have to do some a little bit of work to then argue that you can actually assume that the commutator subgroup of GR is simple. That's, I mean, each trick itself is, is pretty easy by itself, but then you have to combine a number of them. And the theorem just kind of falls out. That's maybe all I'll say about that right now. I won't torture you anymore. Yeah. Another thought so it's about the remark about the invariant. So what about actions which are implementable but not continuously implementable? How an example of what you mean? I don't. No, no. Although I, I, I think probably you can get something like this from like what uh, Max Steven Kane did. You find a, a particular element is the homeomorphism that's I bet that would do it for I'll ask for you. Are there any other questions?